Hello and welcome to another House of Wisdom Lightest and Best Knife video. And today we have a real treat. We're going to look at the lightest and best knives that the Grimsmo brothers have made, and it's the Grimsmo Rask. The first knife they made was the Norseman, and it's a very interesting knife. I have a copy of one here. I haven't done a, a video on it, but I want to one day. And the Norseman was a pretty large knife, but it has a great action. It has this distinctive blade, and it has the CNC milling lines across the edge of the blade instead of just ground with a, a, a belt grinder. So this is a great knife. They wanted to make something smaller and lighter, so they made a knife, the Norseman, that has a four a uh, three point four inch blade this is the one that they did in Dan and steel look how beautiful that Dan and steel blade is anyway they made it smaller and lighter it comes in at uh, three point one ounces on my scale anyway and this is just a incredibly beautiful knife it is a work of art and actually I have it displayed uh, in a case I'll show you a picture of it and it is a golf ball case. They really don't have good knife display cases, so it wouldn't stand on its own. So I got these little things, which are little things. I'll put my hand behind it so you can see it better. Little things you use uh, when you have games, and there's a card that goes in there, and you move them around. But anyway, I put the blade on that, and it allows it to stand upright. And so I think, hey, you can display sculpture. I consider these to be a work of art, and they need to be displayed so people can appreciate their beauty. I don't know. People may think I'm a little weird. I did go a little crazy. Most people only will buy one knife. I bought eight, and my kids and I had a little fun thing with it. My boys especially. I have seven boys. No, I'm not Mormon. No, I'm not Catholic. We just like kids. Um, and each one got to choose a style and a blade texture, uh, a milling pattern, and a clip color. And uh, this is the one that Lucas, my... Uh, he's 14 now. No, he's 15. Uh, he chose, and it's a great blade, has great action. Uh, so I love the Grimsmo brothers. I love their process. I love their type A, obsessive compulsive personality disorders. Do not medicate them. I like them just where they are, and I like their knives too. We're going to talk about them now. The blade is 3.4 inches long. The handle is 4.7 inches long giving a total knife length of 8.1 inches and the weight of 3.1 inches. I'm going to get another blade. We'll get one of the, this is a, one of the Timascus knives. This is the stonewash version. The blade is made of RWL34, similar to CPM154 chemically, just so you know. There comes in different finishes. This is a stonewash, and really it's a mirror stonewash. You can see the reflection there. Um, and it also comes in Damasteel, which you've seen. It comes in acid etched, and they were going to try to make it with a DLC coating, but it never happened. They weren't able to get the process to their satisfaction. And one of the blades, I believe it was this one, uh, was scheduled to be in a DLC just like the clip. Because they couldn't get it, they offered me a Damasteel for free, and uh, I took it up. I like the Damasteel a lot. Anyway, back to the, the blade. Uh, the blade spine is not crowned, however the flipper tab is crowned so it's easy on your finger. And we have a high uh, flat ground here. Uh, the damasteel is a little different. This damasteel is highly etched. Whenever you run your fingernail across it, you can feel those ridges. Not everyone chooses to do their damasteel in such a fashion. I'm going to give you an example of another damasteel blade I have. This is the Max Evolution in the uh, Odin's Eye Pattern by Millet Knives, and, and this is a highly polished, and that's just smooth as can be. Uh, this is different, and actually, this, I think, is a little bit more interesting because you have a little texture as you go across it. Interestingly, though, the actions, and, and I know some of you are going to want to know about this, because it does have a heavy etching, does it affect the ath, uh, action of the knife? And no, that detent ball slides across the blade tang of the damascus steel knife just as easily as it does the RWL34 blades. The method of deployment is by flipper. The flipper, as I mentioned, is crowned even though the spine isn't crowned and it's nice and smooth and easy on your finger. The detent ball on this blade is 
I don't know if you can see the detent ball in there, but the detent ball is flattened on top, and Jerry McGinnis does this also in his knives. It makes for smoother actions, and whenever I ordered my uh, Cody Etzler custom knife, I asked him to do the detent ball with a little flat on top so that it would be as smooth as the McGinnis knife, and he did it for me. So this isn't the first knife I've had with a uh, flattened detent ball, but they all have the same characteristic. They're smooth in their action. We'll talk about the handles now. The handle is uh, made of titanium on both sides and comes in a variety of colors. Here we have silver, purple, gold, blue, and then the Timascus, and we have a black, which is actually DLC. The gold and the bronze are very similar, so I'm going to put them up to one another. The gold is a little lighter in color. The bronze is a little deeper and richer in color. Now, I've taken my gloves off, and I want to talk to you about A Tale of Two Cities. These are two different knives made by the same manufacturer, which is Alamic Tactical. The first knife is the Alamic 24-7, uh, and it has a highly polished finish, and it's in a blue anodized anodization. And the second is the Alamic Busker. It has a kinetic finish instead of the highly polished finished, and it's also in a form of blue. They call this, oh, I believe it's Sky... Anyway, uh, so you have one blue here, and this is a fingerprint magnet because it's got a highly polished finish. Whenever you fingerprint it, it changes the actual color. I don't know if you can appreciate that in this life, but it not only fingerprints it, but it actually changes. Sometimes it'll be blue, sometimes it'll be purple, and that's easily corrected. You can just get some Windex, and I have a paper towel here with some Windex, and you put it on there and you can really tell the color change whenever you Windex it. And then you dry off the Windex and it's more uniform color. And that has more to do with the underlying surface because this is a highly polished surface, it'll fingerprint and change colors. And with the kinetic finish, which is a rougher finish, I show you here, you see the, the striations that they put in that. You can fingerprint this all day and it is completely stable. And look, I'll even put a little bit of Windex on it and it doesn't change colors. You can see that it's wet, but it doesn't change colors at all. And it has more to do. I asked Eugene, the owner of Alamic Tactical, what is the difference in anodization project, process they use? And they say, no, it's the same process. The underlying surface dictates how the anodizing behaves. And so I wanted to talk to you then about the stability of the anodizing and the combination of the anodizing and the process. There are some of the finishes and the colors, like for example the silver, the color is completely stable, and the gold, the color is completely stable also. Whenever you get into the bronze, the color changes a little bit. I'm going to fingerprint it up a little bit, and I don't know. It actually looks kind of cool. You see some blues and some purples, and it's no longer a uniform color, and I think that's kind of cool. And then if you want it to be a uniform color, you can get some Windex, and you can wipe it, and ta-da, it's all uniform again, and it looks beautiful. I just want to let you know, but see, whenever the Windex touches it, it's lighter here and deeper there, and whenever you dry it, it becomes a uniform color, or it dries itself. So you've returned to just a uniform bronze. If color stability is important to you, I wanted you to be aware of that. The least stable color is the purple, and I'm going to put some fingerprints on this, and see if you can appreciate that it goes from purple to a little bit of blue and it'll look a little bit splotchy. But again, uh, you can get some Windex and you can wipe it and see how that turns kind of a gray. And so, and then when you dry it, it becomes completely pure purple again. But I handle these during the video with some vinyl gloves so that it doesn't change the colors. Uh, another one that changes color a little bit, but to a lesser extent, is the blue. And it doesn't go from blue to purple. It just goes from a dark, rich blue to a little bit lighter blue or a little bit silver. And I don't know if you can appreciate that on this video here where you can see it's a little, it's not a, a uniform color anymore. And then you Windex it and it turns back to a uniform color again, especially after you dry it. It gets that deep, rich blue hue. So, in summary, I just wanted to let you know, 
the colors that are stable, if you were to have an option, the silver, the gold, and the black, I didn't do the black for you, but you can fingerprint the black DLC up and it doesn't change a bit either, as well as the Timascus are stable colors. The bronze is a little unstable, but I think it looks even more interesting whenever you fingerprint up the blonde bronze. The blue changes a little bit to a lighter blue or a silver, and the purple changes to from purple to blue with fingerprinting. So if that's not a problem for you, that's not a problem. But if it is a problem, I just want you to be aware of that. So there are different milling patterns that the knives have. This is the angled milling pattern. The CNC machine cuts across in one angle at about a 45 degree angle, and this actually is one of my favorite milling patterns. They also have the crosshatch pattern, and here it is in gold, where the milling machine goes 45 at one and then goes at a 90 degree on the other so that it has these crosshatches. Get that. And then lastly, they have the starburst pattern, and I hope that you can appreciate that. Toward the tail of the knife, the starburst lines are deep and wide, and then they get thinner and lighter until they completely disappear when it gets up to the pivot. This is one of the most interesting and I'm most fond of uh, milling patterns that they have. I don't think that you can appreciate it. Maybe you can whenever you look in here. Yes, you can. You can see that the inside of the knife is extensively milled and uh, pocketed so that it makes it a very light knife. This is a 3.4 inch blade and only weighs 3.1 ounces, which is a great weight to length ratio. The construction of the knife, it has two standoffs at the back and, uh, and it has the pivot and it's an open construction. You can blow it out and clean it very easily. One of the interesting things on the pivot is, um, and on the blade stops, it has two blade stops and uh, so that's just the way they chose to do it. They could have made a shorter groove in the blade and used one blade stop, but they chose to use two blade stops, and I assume because it adds better structural stability to it. I guess you could ask the Grimsmo brothers. The pivot is a ceramic caged bearing and is a captive pivot. Uh, even though this looks around, there is a shelf there and then a shelf on the inside of the blade, and when it fits in there and is tightened down, it won't rotate at all. Different manufacturers have done it in different ways. This is Kai USA's hexagonal pivot. This is the Zero Tolerance 0900, and it doesn't rotate whenever you try to undo it because it has a hexagonal shape. Uh, Booze has a tri-wing shape pivot, and this one they left round on the outside, but on the inside it's got a milled uh, shelf on it as well as the knife blade, so it doesn't rotate whenever you use the T9 Torx to disassemble the pivot there. Oh, it's polished and shiny. Isn't that beautiful? The lock on the knife, uh, this is a frame lock knife. It has an over travel stop. Let's see if I can get that in the light. There you go. You see the blue over travel stop there. It doesn't have a lock bar insert, but the end of the lock bar is carbonized and it has no lock stick whatsoever. The pocket clip is a 3D milled clip. This has the crosshatch pattern in blue on it, as well as the blue hardware. And I don't know if you can appreciate it, but inside on the underside of the pocket clip, it says Grimm's Mo Knives. There's another pocket clip I consider to be very pretty, and that is the Timascus pocket clip on this purple one. Oh my gosh, isn't that beautiful? I wanted to get this one. I got it in both blue and purple because in the Timascus, those are the predominant colors. There's some blue and there's some purple, and it matches well with the Timascus. So I have one side is Timascus, one side is purple, and then the clip is purple, and see how it brings out the purple in the clip. And the same thing I did, I did a Timascus, uh, one side Timascus and one side blue, but the predominant colors are blue and purple, and so it matches really well both in the purple and the blue because there's both purple and blue brought out in the Timascus. Really like these guys. Oh well, the ergonomics. I'll get the DLC. I haven't showed it any love yet. This is the DLC version. Love the DLC version. Uh, the ergonomics are great mostly because the design is simple. It has a, a place for your fingers to go and then a sweeping line. And it's over a four-inch knife look. I have a good couple of centimeters there at the end. 
And so even if you have a large hand, this knife is going to fit well for you. The action is amazing. Uh, we used to say Shirogorov Smooth, but I've changed that to Grimsmo Rask Smooth. This blade just falls. You've got to get your hand out of the way or it'll guillotine your hand. It completely returns with gravity. It is a joy to play with. And the value. The initial cost of the knife for just a plain knife, I'll get one of the plain knives. Um, yeah, something like this where you just change the color. That had a DLC clip. I don't know if that was a little bit extra. Nope, that's a, that's a shiny one. Okay, here's a plain knife um, with a bronze finish and just a mirror stonewashed blade. This would be $675, um, and that represented an enormous bargain. Uh, immediately on the secondary market on eBay, they were selling for over $1,000. And I mentioned this to John Grimsmo, and here's what he said. One of the things in everybody's mind is you sell your base model uh, knife for six to $700, yet on the secondary market, they garner a much higher price. Tell me about your pricing structure and your philosophy behind yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely humbling to see the prices go so much higher on the secondary market. And I, I gotta admit, there's part of me that's like, I wish I had that money, you know, but the fact of the matter is I'm very comfortable with the six to $700 price point for our base model knives. And I, I truly feel that if we increased it to closer to $1,000, I think we're we're eliminating like 80% of our potential customers who can just barely afford the, the price that we have right now. And I don't want to lose that 80% of people. I, I want to be able to satisfy them. So the days of making your own custom order where you can choose your milling pattern and your handle color and the clip color, your hardware color, the blade style and treatment, those days are gone. All they have now is a uh, a maker's choice sign-up form and... Um, the cost of the knife is about $300 more than its original outing. So that's good because John Grimsmo and Eric are now taking care of their families as well as their customers. And the cost of the knife initially is more in line with the secondary value on its secondary market. Um, the knife is not a pre-order. You don't pay any money. Uh, they make what they like. They contact you. And you get first rights of refusal if you like what they made. The signage on the knife is minimal. On the show side, it's sterile, except that on the pivot, you see the Grimsmo symbol, its maker's mark. And then on the other side, they have the Grimsmo symbol on the clip. And then on the blade on the clip side, they have the word Rask, the model number. This happens to be number 271. And then the steel type, RWL34. On the inside of the lock bar, and I don't know if you can see this, they have written Grimsmo Rask and then the month and year of manufacture, mine happens to be August of 2017. And as I've mentioned, on the underside of the clip, it says Grimsmo Knives. So what do I think about the Grimsmo Rask? I absolutely love it. There is no other knife that I have ordered eight of, so trust me, I really like this knife. Is there opportunities for improvement? Sure. The anodizing, for example, in the purple and the blue uh, is a little bit unstable and to a lesser extent the bronze. Uh, however, the silver, the gold, and the timascus don't change it with color, uh, with fingerprinting at all. In the knife, uh, there are ceramic bearings, but there aren't any steel races inside the pivot. Some manufacturers choose to do that. This is only a theoretic concern that over time the harder ceramic ball bearings might wear away the timascus. Something to think about. And there's no lock bar insert on this knife. It's just carbonized. Theoretically, the carbonization could wear away and the lock stick could develop. But right now, there's no lock stick and this is the smoothest knife I have. And the other thing is the availability. You can't order one and you can't customize it. You can get on their Maker's Choice sign-up form and if uh, you like what they make, which you will, you can have it and you get the first rights of refusal, but they want to keep it small and, and limited in volume. Therefore, these will always be a rare knife and always be a valuable knife. But what do I like? Most of all, I like the information that's hidden on the inside and the attention to detail. They have extensive milling and they have a lot of the information on the inside of the lock bar and inside the handle and on the underside of the clip. And that gives the presentation side, the show side, a nice clean look. 
The only thing they have on the show's spite is the markers, maker's mark of the Grimsmo, this Nordic guy with a, a war helmet on, and I think it looks completely cool. And the same thing on the clip side. It's uncluttered and is just a beautiful knife. The action is smooth. And I used to say something with Shirogorov smooth, and now whenever I describe a Shirogorov knife, I'm going to be saying, this is Grimsmo smooth. And I like the lightness. They did such uh, extensive milling that they got the knife weight down of a 3.4 inch blade knife to 3.1 ounces, and that is incredibly light. It makes me very happy. The other thing I like about it is they make it all in-house, except for the ceramic bearings. They even machine the washers that the bearings fit into. And they don't buy the washers at Alpha Knife Supply like everybody else. They make their own screws also. I don't know if I pointed out that to you, but uh, the torque screw is a, a six-sided star. And then between the points of the star, they have little dots. And that's just to show off their machining work and say, hey, I made this screw. This is not something I bought off the shelf at Alpha Knight Supply. Well... My final comments, the Grimsmo brothers have an enormous attention to detail. Their rasp has wonderfully smooth action and is completely made in-house. It's the lightest and best from Grimsmo knives. I highly recommend it. You need to get on their order form. And let me know what you think about the Grimsmo rasp in the comments section. Like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next House of Wisdom Lightest and Best Knife Review video.